Welcome to tonight's event. I'm Rob Wright, Interim Dean of the Daniels Faculty. Uh, and the event tonight is Imagining the Future Through Design, featuring Sputniko and Georgina Voss. First, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Daniels honors Indigenous peoples past, present, and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us today. This event tonight is organized by a new faculty member, Marina Yablina. Maria was a successful candidate for our search for a new faculty member with expertise in digital fabrication. Maria's practice focuses on design, machines that make architecture. Her work lies at the intersection of architecture and robotics, producing spaces and robotic systems that can construct themselves and change in real time. We are so fortunate to have Maria join our faculty this year. Now back to our host, Maria. Thank you so much, Dean Wright, for this lovely introduction. It is my great pleasure to have this opportunity to introduce our guests today, Sputniko and Georgina Voss. Sputniko, who we'll be hearing from first, is a Japanese-British artist and designer joining us from Tokyo today. Uh, and it's actually already Friday in Tokyo, so I guess one could say that she's joining us somewhat from the future. Uh, Sputniko is currently an associate professor at the Tokyo University of Arts. Uh, prior to that position, uh, she has also founded and directed the design fiction group at the MIT Media Lab. Her practice in teaching spans and breaks boundaries between many disciplines and mediums with a clear focus on exploring the social and ethical implications of emerging technologies. She's a TED fellow and has been selected as one of the young global leaders by the World Economic Forum in 2017. To date, her work has been included in the permanent collections of museums such as the Victoria and Albert Museum and the 21st Century Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, Kanazawa. She has recently exhibited her work at venues such as the Cooper Hewitt, Hewitt Design Triennale, Broken Nature at the Milan International Design Triennale, and Satauchi Art Triennale, where she created a permanent art pavilion at the Benassi Art Site in Toshima, the project that I believe we will have a chance to see today in her presentation. Also joining us today in the role of respondent is Georgina Voss, an artist, writer, and educator. Originally trained as technology in technology anthropology and industrial economics, her work explores the politics, presence, and deviance of large-scale machines and technical systems through performance, multimedia installation, writing, and investigative research projects. Georgina is reader in systems and deviance in the design school uh, at London College of Communication, University of the Arts London, and co-founder and lead of Super System Studio. She is also founder and co-director of consultancy Strange Telemetry and currently a resident at Somerset House Studios. Georgina's work has been exhibited and performed in spaces including Tate Modern, Auto Italia Southeast, London Design Festival, and TAC Eindhoven. Her writing has been published in places including The Atlantic, The Guardian, Science as Culture, Economic Science Fictions by MIT Press, Journal of Economic Geography, and Journal of Homosexuality. She's currently working on her second book, which I'm personally extremely excited about, on experience and systems with Verso. Uh, before I pass on this virtual stage, uh, stage to Sputniko with her talk, followed by Georgina and her response, I would like to mention a few things to our lovely audience. Uh, first things first, if you have any questions to the speakers um, as they're presenting and as they're having the conversation, please feel free to ask them anytime. But one thing we'll ask you to do is to not use chat, but rather use the Q&A function for questions. Of course, feel free to use chat for chatting, but it, the questions should go into the Q&A, which will make it way easier for myself uh, and Georgina to actually kind of quickly see them all in one place and kind of filter through them. So that would be really appreciated. And other ways, please enjoy the event. Um, I am personally absolutely thrilled to have both Sputniko and Georgina join us today. And now to Sputniko and her presentation, her talk. Great. Thank you so much, Maria, for the introduction. And I'm so happy to meet Maria and Georgina today online. But, you know, you know like it's, it's really great to have this opportunity. And, you know, I hope someday we could meet in real person, like travel freely. But th this is great. So thank you. So I'm going to share you um, my slides. Okay.
Yeah, can you can you see the slides? No, wait. Um, can you see it right now? Yes. Oh. Hmm. It keeps going. You, you don't see my desktop. You just see the slides, I hope. I <laughs> just, just the... see the slides. Yeah, the, slides. the keynote. Oh. All right, just the keynote. Yeah. OK, you don't see my messy desktop. OK, no. <laughs> Great, thank you. OK, uh, so I'm going to start a bit um, with the introduction of my background. So I'm, uh, my father's Japanese, my mother's British, and I was born in Japan. And uh, my parents are both mathematicians. So I really grew up loving math, mathematics and computer science. So I was a computer programming geek in high school. So quite naturally, when I was going, trying to go to uni, I went to Imperial College London in London to study mathematics and computer science. So I was at Imperial uh, studying, but then um, while I was studying like all these new artificial intelligence or bioinformatics and all these different amazing developments in engineering, I started to become aware, more aware of the gender gap that was happening in technology and science, especially since I was one of the very few women studying uh, at Imperial College, studying engineering there. And more I realized, wow, like there's a lot of gender gap and it's not just gender. Like it, at the time it's very male dominated, also in Britain, very white dominated. There's this racial inequality happening. And I thought, well, there needs to be more people imagining the future of tech, you know, diverse future of tech. And at the same time, uh, RCA was right next door of Imperial College. And I would visit their graduation show quite often. And I realized that there was this course called Design Interactions. They were showing very interesting work in the graduation work. Uh, so it was design works that were asking questions about technology, the futures. And I thought, oh, that, this is an interesting course. And I, I decided to apply and I somehow, sorry, that's an MA, sorry, it's not MS. But um, I got in the MI, uh, MA Design Interactions and I created my graduation pieces, which and one of them was Menstruation Machine, so Crowbot Jenny. And after that, I started exhibiting in different museums. And uh, when I was 28, I was uh, very fortunately um, invited by the MIT Media Lab to start a new research group called Design Fiction Group. So I was there as an assistant professor for four years. And after that, I, three years ago, I moved back to Tokyo to become an associate professor at University of Tokyo uh, at the Institute of Industrial Science. And then 2019, I moved to Tokyo University of Arts to become an associate professor of design. What, what was, what's quite surprising was that I am the first female professor of design in Tokyo University of Arts ever. So um, there are 10 faculty members in design department and I'm the very first female and it's, it's typical Japanese situation in that. But other than um, showing and teaching, like Maria said, I'm a TED fellow and also a young global leader. So I give talks in these different uh, settings. So um, at the RCA Design Interactions, um, I was studying under Professor Anthony Dunn, and Fiona Raby and at RCA, I, um, I was really um, fortunate to really learn and work with speculative design. So I don't know how many of you in the audience no, or maybe you know a lot already, but so speculative design is the idea that design is not just designing for you know functional aesthetic purposes. It's, um, it's an idea that designers can design to ask questions and stimulate discussions about the future, about the social, cultural, and ep ep uh, ethical implications of technologies and where these technologies can lead us. 
So that way of thinking was very um, inspiring to me and it really influenced my work. And also I mentioned a little bit about growing up in Japan. So growing up in Japan, I was frustrated with many, many gender um, inequality. And that really happens um, a lot in technology and science. And one really good example is um, how long it took Japan to approve the contraceptive pills compared to how long it took for them to approve the Viagra. So contraceptive pills in a, a Japan was approved only in 1999. That's the latest out of all United Nations states. So this is a graph showing the year that different countries approved the contraceptive pills. And you can see that most countries approved the pill in the 60s and the 70s. I mapped it um, against the um, gender gap ranking <laughs> in Davos. And you can see that um, Japan was almost 40 years um, later than the United States. And the reason why the Japanese government didn't approve the pill was that the Japanese politicians, most of them, they're not enough women deciding these regulations. And there were voices saying that contraceptive pills might uh, spread uh, STDs, might make women too sexually uh, outward. These were the voices heard when uh, they were trying to decide the regulations and the uh, contraceptive pills. But Viagra, I would imagine <laughs> Viagra would make uh, some men, I don't know, sexually <laughs> outward compared to contraceptive pills, I don't know. But um, Viagra at the time already had uh, more than 100 people uh, who died from the side effects. So um, in terms, uh, it, it was still also very new, but Japan somehow um, only took six months to approve the Viagra. And it makes you wonder <laughs> how maybe some people in power really want to use Viagra very, very quickly, I don't know. <laughs> but um, the, the, this is just one of many, many things that happen in tech and science. You think that technology and science, maybe these things uh, get approved, it spreads equally. Uh, no, that's not really the case. It's really impacted by social issues, cultural issues, political issues, who in, who's in power. And um, growing up in Japan, I was really concerned about um, gender issues surrounding tech. Uh, so I'd like to show you uh, my first project I'd like to show you. This is work I created at the RCA as my graduation piece. And I think this is a work that for, like, went viral for me for, for the first time. And then I showed in different kinds of uh, museum like MoMA or Museum Contemporary Art. So this is a um, menstruation machine, a machine that is designed to allow men to experience the whole process of menstruation that includes the pain. So I designed the machine to have these electrodes on the abdomen to simulate this dull pain that women get through the menstruation period. And also there's a tank at the back that stores 80 milliliters of blood. That's an average blood that women um, bleed during menstruation. So blood flows through between the legs uh, in the next, in the five day period. So one reason why I designed a machine that allows, or it doesn't have, like it's, you know, allow people who don't have menstruation to experience menstruation is that um, I felt that, so I, I've been menstruating for a long time now. I've been menstruating more than 20 years now, but it, you know, it's a nuisance. It happens every month. Uh, it's painful. Uh, it's a mess and it makes my mental, you know, state grow up and down. And I think it affects a lot, lots of people, well, at least half the population on this planet have been affected greatly by menstruation. But um, especially in 2010, at the time, I was really annoyed that there was not enough discussion about menstruation and there was not enough information about how to solve um, issues surrounding menstruation. So for example, contraceptive pills, they are very useful ways to control menstruation issues like PMS can be managed and controlled through the pill. 
Uh, there's also IUD, like Mirena, like these uh, equipment technology you can use to really reduce the amount of menstruation. So there, there's these different technologies that you could use to solve the issues surrounding menstruation, menstruation. But at the time, I, I thought there's not enough discussion in the media, online. And what if I design a machine that more people could experience this process? And if I could create discussions surrounding, surrounding this issue? And, you know, if if men can at least experience for one year menstruation, I've been experiencing more than 20 years, <laughs> like it may be then the world can be a better place if there's more understanding surrounding this issue. So I designed a machine and also I'm gonna start playing the video. Uh, I'll talk over. I'm originally a musician. That, uh, so I wrote a song about this menstruation machine and I also created a script and I directed a music video sur um, surrounding this machine. And it... can, can you hear me talking? So, yeah. So, so I'm gonna talk over the video. So um, I, the video is about this main character, Takashi. So he likes to, you know, it's, I'm, I'm playing a man who likes to you know, dress up uh, aesthetically uh, as a woman, but he decides that you know, if he wants to really understand what it feels like to be a woman, then he wants to really um, experience menstruation. So it's not just fashion or aesthetic thing. He wants to really wear menstruation to understand what it feels like and talk with his female friends. So I'll, I'll show you the video. Okay, so you can see that video on YouTube. Uh, so the, the link is in the chat as well. So when I posted this video on YouTube, it suddenly just went viral. It was spread all over the internet. And at the time, it was an intentional choice for me to embrace this YouTube social media pop culture, actually. So when I was making this work, my tutors at RCA were a little bit unsure of me posting it in YouTube with this pop music, but 
um, right now, I think TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, it's a big part of our life. But for me, at, at the time, like 10 years ago, I thought, well, if you're designing for debate, designing to discussion, why don't I use a medium that is the most very, very powerful becoming? And, and it really worked at the time. So it, I got... Um, yeah, it spread all over online uh, on different forums. And I was also invited to show also in museum settings. But um, then um, I actually, in Japan, <clears throat> a major record label, music label, signed me on as a musician. And Vogue Japan in J uh, awarded me Woman of the Year after. <laughs> so kind of shifted from like designer, also a pop personality in Japan. The Board Japan Woman, Woman of the Year Shoengi Museum. So that the first cross happened with this work. So that's music, uh, menstruation machine. And then I'll move on to the next project. So the, this project is uh, called the Moonwalk Machine. So this is work I started creating after getting contacted from uh, University Space Research Association. This is an organization that's close to NASA in uh, Texas, Houston. And they are working to try to spread uh, knowledge about the space and space research uh, in school, in education. And they uh, contacted, one day they contacted me by email saying that they would like more uh, women, uh, young women interested in space research and science. And they wanted to know how they could work together. So. I thought, well, that, that's a really great idea. And together we uh, created a script and a music video. And this is this video, it's about this character, Selena. So she loves space and she would love to go to space. And, but she's annoyed that uh, currently uh, on the moon, uh, ever since Neil Armstrong had this gigantic leap for humankind, it's been, you know, it's been 50 years since he's put this gigantic leap of humankind. But there's only 12 white macho American guys who walked on the surface of the moon. So she's really annoyed about that. And she wants more female footprints on the moon and she wants female footprints on Mars. So uh, she decides that, well, you know, if she can't go right now, she's going to create a moon rover. And uh, she has this superheroine she loves called a uh, lunar girl. It's like Sailor Moon character. And uh, well, she's, she created this moon rover that would walk around the surface of the planet on the moon and leaves this lunar girl high heel superhero footprints on the surface of the moon. So that, that's the story. And this story, so this is the exhibition we did at the Museum of Contemporary Art Kanazawa. And this story is actually inspired by this 13-year-old um, girl in California. I'm gonna show the video. So I was really interested in this like DIY culture happening uh, on YouTube and this girl for her summer homework project she decided to launch her favorite Hello Kitty into space and film her Hello Kitty from outer space using GoPro. I'll show you. So I really love the fact that you think space research is something for a very small limited kind of people, but it's through the internet, it's becoming like open citizen science, DIY science was becoming more widespread.
yeah. Yeah, like I don't have enough time, so I'm gonna. So this is this is the video I I I, I wrote the music, directed it. I'm also playing Lunar Girl, the superhero. So I'll show you the. Thank you. That, that's on YouTube. Oh, thank you for the comment. <laughs> All right. So um, that's another video. And uh, oh, thanks. I love being able to see the comments like that. <laughs> um, 
but um, I'll move on to the next project. So you see here that I, I love working with technologies and thinking of new stories and writing music, making video, putting it on online. And the next project is I'm looking at the, um, this is actually about the future of biotech and genetic engineering. So it's called the Red Silker Fate, uh, Tamaki's Crush. And uh, this I showed at Setoguchi Art Triennale and also um, part of collection at VNA Museum. And I don't know how many of you in this audience have heard of the mythology of Red String of Fate. It's called Hong Xian in Chinese or Ume no Akaito in Japanese. So this is a very well-known mythology in China and Japan and also Korea, I think. And it's a mythology that says two people destined to meet each other romantically have this invisible red string in between them. And this is a beautiful mythology that we often see in novels or manga, but we, th we think, well, that's, but that's something in fantasy and mythology. But um, recently, as I was researching and reading a lot about what's happening in biotech and genetic engineering, I started to feel like, well, sometimes people say, oh, bioengineering, it's going into the realms of the gods. Well, I felt like, yeah, like scientists are almost going in the realms of the gods, almost creating their own new mythology through science. So I started to look at, I want, in this project, I want to look at the relationship between, between this scientist's creation and how they might be creating this new mythology. And what I did was that I worked together with Professor Hideki Sezutsu. He's a scientist in National Institute of Agrobiological Sciences. And he, I'm gonna show you this video. So this is a video of a silkworm and you can see the silkworm's eyes are glowing red and green. And these, the eyes are glowing red and green because of adding the DNA of a red glowing coral or a green glowing jellyfish into the silkworms. So by adding the genes, DNA of those um, glowing coral or jellyfish, you could make the silkworms eyes glow red and green. And also the silk that they produce glow red and green in that color. And this looks like science fiction, but this is actually like research that's realized. And, it, and this video is shot through my smartphone. <laughs> and this is, I, I was really surprised by what they were capable of doing. And it's not just glowing. You could add many kinds of different DNA. For example, you could add a DNA that produces um, spider web so that by adding the DNA, the silkworm produces a silk that's half silk and half spider web, which means the silk is very, very strong. Or you can add DNA that creates substances used as medication for um, can cancer patients. So you could create silkworm that produce silk, but contains this medicine that is very useful for cancer patients. So, it's, it's a very new way of thinking about how um, to produce different kinds of material. So I talked to Professor Suzuki and I said, well, like this research you're doing is very um, interesting to me. And yeah, you know, we hear about the mythology of red st string of fate, Honshen or Kaito in Japanese. What if you add a DNA that produces oxytocin? And oxytocin, I don't know if you heard of oxytocin, it's known as a short social bonding hormone, like a love hormone. So it's something that's produced when you're in love or hugging someone. What if you add a DNA that produces oxytocin and also add a DNA of a red glowing coral? Can you create a silkworm that produces a red glowing string that contains this love hormone? Something a little bit like the red string of fate. And when I uh, proposed that idea to Professor, he looked a bit surprised, but said, actually, it is possible. We can 
create that red string of fate. So after having this discussion, uh, in just six weeks, he sent me the photograph. Oh, uh, sorry, it's not six weeks. In six weeks, he injected the DNA into the silkworm egg. And then uh, eight months after the first discussion, he sent me this photograph, which is the first, um, this red glowing silk with contains this love hormone oxytocin, something a little bit like the red string of fate. So at the time I thought, wow, like, this is something that only happens in fantasy and mythology, but working together with scientists that was recreated like that in just eight months. And I felt like, well, maybe it, it, it really inspired me to write a new, a future mythology that could happen from the lab, from biology. And so I decided to um, so create this story about this character, Tamaki. So she is a genetic engineering engineer in the lab, but she has a big crush on her colleague, uh, Sachihiko, which I'm playing, Sachihiko. So she has a big, big crush but she feels that uh, Sajihiko doesn't seem to realize that she has a crush and maybe there's no red string of fate in between them. But she decides, okay, if there's no red string of fate, well, she's going to genetically engineer her own special red string of fate to try to get the love of her life, Sajihiko, to her. So that's the story. But while she makes the red string of fate, so she makes a string and she sews it onto her favorite scarf and she goes to meet Sachihiko. She runs out to meet Sachihiko. Very strange, strange mythical powers start to um, reside in Tamaki. So very strange things start to happen in the video. So when I was writing the story, I was reading a lot of Japanese mythology. So um, Tamaki, the, their name like Tamaki or Sachihiko, these are names that I took from the original Japanese mythology of love. So there's a love story between Princess Tamaki, who's living in the ocean, and Prince uh, Sachihiko living in the mountains, and they they get they fall in love and they have children together. But because um, Sachihiko is a human, but Tamaki is from the ocean, so she's not a human. She's a shark or a dragon. So it's it's a mythology, but also talks about um, mixing between different species. <laughs> so I decided to take that mythology and make a future mythology of species mixing and strange things occurring. So I'll show you the video of that future mythology. It's <laughs>運命の赤い糸で結ばれている。そんな神話のような糸を紡ぐ解雇が 
イアンホルモンオキシトシンを作る遺伝子をこの卵に注射すれば恋に落ちる運命の赤い糸を生み出せるはず蚕の目が光れば成功のサインなんだけど折れちゃったベイビー Thank you. So, just to let you know, the red string at Silk of Fate doesn't work that well. You know, like you don't get 100 people following you. It's so that, that's, that's a bit fictional. <laughs> but, but、um, anyhow, so we actually created a real Shinto shrine based on this、uh, new mythology. And that's the permanent work I did in Teshima, which is、uh, an island next to Naoshima. The,、um, I don't know if you've been, it's like an art island in Japan. So we renovated an old, old Japanese house and we created、um, this structure where you could put your wishes on, like with a writing board. And inside the shrine, there's a lab of Tamaki. So you can see how she created her new myth future mythology in the lab. And the local people of the island came to this future shrine where to write wishes about you know, their love or partner, family, and they put the wishing boards on the shrine structure. So that, that's okay. I'll move on to the next project. So,、um, the next project is called the Tokyo Medical University for Rejected Women. So, In this work, I created a fictional university, and I am the president, as you can see, and there's a chairwoman, Tomomi Nishizawa. And I founded this university and created an university brochure and performance. And the reason why I made this university was in response to this big scandal that happened in Japan in 2018. So it's only two years ago. 
two and a half years ago, they found that many medical schools in Japan, it's not just one, it was quite many, they, they found that they were deducting points of female applicants to intentionally reduce the number of women who studied medicine in the university. So they, they've been doing that all these years and it's only in 2018 that they were found out. So the ratio of female doctors is very low in Japan. It's only about less than 20% are female doctors. And you see here, like, well, even if you study very hard, the universities, they were deducting points off women so they can't study. And that was very shocking to, uh, to so many people. And I think it, it was in the news all over the world. And you can see the, profe the university is apologizing and they, they said they're, gonna, they're not going to do that anymore. And the excuse they had was they said, well, you know, even if we educate women or they get married and quit jobs. So what's we felt that we should reduce the, it, that it was completely unacceptable. So we created this sort, sort of black humor university for these women who were rejected from these Japanese medical school. So we created a curriculum catering for these rejected women because you know we don't they're very talented women rejected or how can we fully um, you fully really cater for these very talented women so the idea of the university is that well since Japan loves male doctors male looking doctors well why don't we create this perfect male doctor cyborg uh, together that's that can function efficiently than any other human male doctors. Uh, we would box them up and uh, deliver them, these doctors on drones throughout Japan to help Japan have a better medical, <laughs> medical talent through these super elite male doctor robots. So we created this brochure with like Q and A and we did a big performance I, I'm there as a president, um, announcing the, the opening of the school, putting a male doctor on the robot. And we did an open campus exhibition. So, so and then I'll show you, like I, we created a very cheesy um, university video. I'll show you. Actually, can you read the subtitles? Shall I make it full screen? Maybe that's easier. The sub皆さんこんにちは。ようこそ東京原点女子大へ。学長のスプツニコです。理事長の西澤智美です。本大学は最先端のテクノロジーを駆使し、女子生徒たちに医療での活躍の場を提供する学校です。医学の進歩を第一に
派遣が決まるとエリートドクターとなった男性たちは箱に梱包されドローンによってさまざまな病院へ運ばれますエリートドクターによって世の中の医学はさらに発展していくことでしょう自分は男性に負けない医者になるためにずっと勉強してきましたなのになんで第一志望の大学に入れなかったのか疑問でしょうがないですなんでですかね点数下げられてたりしてでも今ではこの大学で良かったと思ってますよ自分の作った男性ドクターが活躍してくれた時はすごくやりがいを感じますしみんな幸せになれるんだから素晴らしいですよねそうですね毎日充実していてすごく楽しいです私は一度大学受験を失敗したんですけど浪人して悩んでいた時この大学を知って自分の居場所はここしかないと思いました女性でもこんなに医療に貢献できるんだって希望が持てましたこれからもよりエリートな男性ドクターを作れるように頑張っていきたいと思いますさああなたもこの大学に入学して私たちと共に男性ドクターが活躍する平和な世界を目指しましょうあなたに会える日を楽しみにしていますいやそう Oops. You could buy the university brochure on Amazon. So、uh, there's both the English version and the Japanese version. So I, I'm going to find the link and give it to you because it's, it's only $1. And if you buy the university brochure,、uh, we give all the profits to an、uh, organization helping women's education around the world. It's called Plan International. So I'm going to try to. Dig it up、uh, later <laughs> to give you the link of the university brochure. So, yeah, when we showed this work, what, we were very surprised to get a complaint letter from Tokyo,、uh, actually, Tokyo Medical University for Women. <laughs> so, I,、uh, the president of Tokyo Medical University for Women sent a letter to me、uh, complaining that this fictional school. Um, the name is too similar to their university, and, the, and I, they need an apology. So I, I, that was pretty funny because I thought, you know, this doesn't make sense. You know, obviously, people could tell this is a complete black humor school. I don't think they're going to apply to, they're gonna apply to my school by mistake. But anyhow, so I think we're running out of time. So that's thank you so much for. Listening to my talk, and I'm really looking forward to talking with Georgina、um, Maria. Thank you. Oh, and thanks, Maria, for sharing the Amazon link. Did you find the English version? It, it's on the chat. Oh, I think that's the Japanese edition. There's, there's also an English、oh. one. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to dig that out and also send it. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Phew. <laughs> hey,、um, so I'll just like give you, give you a break to kind of like get some more water down you and say thank you so much. That was so great.、Um, I've known, yeah, I've, I've been such a fan of your projects for such a long time. They are great things to look at and great things for teaching. And it's just been, yeah, it's been delightful、um, to thank you. hear you go through them.、Um, So, I just for、um, the, the crowd here, for the 87 participants,、um, I'm going to give a bit of a response to Sputniko.、Um, we'll have a bit of a chat to, about some things, then we'll open the floor to questions. And I can see we've got a few things coming through the QA. So, with Maria's help, we'll respond to those. So, in all honesty, I had a series of questions pre prepped before the talk that were quite. Starting quite serious and quite、mm, and thinking about the nature of truth and reality. And what at the end of that presentation, Like, I'm in London, it's one o'clock in the morning, and like that was the nearest thing I've had to like going clubbing in quite a long time. Like, whoever it was in the chat said that was a great bop, it was like absolutely true.、Um, so, I think I kind of I wanted to start on that point, really,、um, of like great teams and great videos.、Um, so, my background as well kind of comes from the, the sciences originally in biochemistry before moving into anthropology, and now also working in a design school and bumping around with also many. Graduates of the, the Design Interactions program. So it's, it's fascinating to kind of see how that kind of type of practice has kind of 
expanded and been articulated, particularly over the past decade. And one of the things that really struck me from not just looking, but like listening to your work as well, was how unexpectedly subversive it was. I think that was the kind of thing that really jumped out at me. Um, and I know we're talking about kind of very big and specific topics, particularly around kind of gender biases in science and technology, but there was something about the way that it all gets kind of wrapped together and beautifully developed as these short poppy videos that get with beautiful production values and like great design and like the lyrics and that just get trapped in your head. Um, and I think with your continual kind of like presence dotting up through them as, you know, as a kind of a moody scientist and the head of a medical school and a space girl, um, that felt like it was doing some really interesting subversive work to kind of bring together these quite complicated and heavy and multifaceted issues in a way that was like, you're like easily articulated, um, but also kind of the travel as well that you kind of, you can get a hand with. And I, so that was one thing I was kind of curious if you could like maybe talk a little bit about where <laughs> kind of the idea, the notion of being able to work with this very yeah. popular, uh, popular form of music is like absolute mm. grandma, but you know, this kind of this very specific kind of trope and aesthetics, but also how, what also struck me with this was, as you said at the beginning, a lot of speculative design work um, aims to unbundle through its own reflexive design practices mm -hmm. and providing a way to think about these social and economic and political and te technological issues, um, but can sometimes get caught in the shoelaces of the existing tropes around science and technology as well. And I'm really, what I think I, I was so fascinated about with your work is how you do deliberately play on like the bland marketing of a university or mm -hmm. of kind of, um, like you said, the kind of the Japanese mythology about red strings um, or kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the dreamy pop star, you know, running around with their beautiful hair. And I was wondering like how, where that balance lies for you as well around, right working with but pushing back on those tropes and how you get those to do the work as well so I think that that's the first thing I'd like to kick off with yeah thank you for the question because I, I think I do realize that like that my work output is a little bit different from some speculative design <laughs> works that <laughs> you see <laughs> and also um, there are many reasons behind that I guess like one big reason is before I went to RCA, I was already a musician writing pop song, pop music. So I was performing as Sputnik girl in like clubs in London. And growing up in Japan, I like manga and cheesy pop music kind of is part of me now, seem, seeped inside of me, this cheesy pop culture of Tokyo. But that, so that's one thing. But then also, um, I wanted to, especially while I was a student at RCA, I was really interested in infiltrating the pop culture. And nowadays, I think it's just uh, obvious that you could use TikTok and Snapchat and YouTube to infiltrate pop culture. It's almost, it's much stronger than the mainstream, like pop culture almost, like the social media. But at the time, I felt like there was a lot of flexibility and freedom. And so I wanted to hack the pop culture to open up these discussions to a wider audience. And another thing is I, I grew up watching Japanese television and I was also frustrated at the kind of um, female um, icons that were on TV. They were often, uh, weak, not very, uh, no, not very intelligent. Uh, they'll never debate, they never fight. So I thought, well, if I'm gonna make videos, it's, it's wrapped in this pop uh, wrapping, but you see women fighting, thinking, uh, talking, taking action. So that's like the other big reason. So mm. then that, so my, my musical in interest and my wish to have the pop culture turned into a menstruation machine or crowbot Jenny, that's another work. Yeah. Moon work machine. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's really yeah, it's fascinating about the kind of the, uh, the kind of the female icons as well. There's been some really 
I think there's a, a question that's coming up through that in the chat, but there's been some really interesting research um, from around gender and public engagement with science and technology that said that you kind of, the engineer, the female engineers uh, or who are so depicted in popular culture, who are the ones that people actually really like or that women really like when they're thinking about going into disciplines are the ones who are a, a bit more grounded and down to worth and not the ones who are kind of have the super career and have kind of, you know, the super life as well. It's actually much more kind of you know, grounded in what they're doing. And I kind of feel that's something that kind of comes through with the work that you've done as well. But I, yeah, I love the idea of hacking the pop culture with this. And so that kind of, that, lead, that yeah, it's your, sorry. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> we're kind of like, <laughs> they're chatting over to each other from thousands of miles away. Um, so that was that was also something else I was wondering about as well with kind of this kind of this collapsing disciplinarity as well, you know, and not and not just not just from you, of like having the music background and like I love the idea of you running around the clubs in London by night and then heading to Kensington by day to do like your studies at Imperial and the RCA. Um, but also kind of like I guess the space of like what this work is. Um, so you you know you come out of science technology, you have a music background, you've Tra trained in design yeah. and this is a talk that's been hosted by Daniel so I imagine we've got a bunch of like a bunch of architecture and design students here but you know architecture and design are by their nature quite multidisciplinary and multifaceted mm -hmm. and kind of messy in a way in a way that I, I like teaching um, and then you've got the span of a career that goes across MIT and that goes from in into an industrial school and then to kind of where you are now in an art and design school um, so it feels like there's this really interesting way that you've, you're using these kind of these narratives to talk through and over all these different disciplines. And I was curious about, do you, have you, have you felt that kind of the identity of who you are, the work you've done has changed or has had to be kind of like rotated as you've kind of like moved through, you know, MIT to designers okay. to something else or yeah, how, how's that kind of work? How's that worked out for you? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's always shifting and changing. Like, I think the, one big change I, i'm a kind of person who gets very bored if i can predict the next five or ten years so like what i mean by it is that you know there, there there's a typical like say okay an architect or a designer or an artist artist i think if you look up like 10 years 20 years like people who are senior have a senior career than you you can see that there's certain different paths with orthodox paths you could take but i'm sure like i think these ways of progressing your work is always shifting so um i get i don't want to just go through a conventional step i'm always trying to think this is what i like to do then what medium suits best how can i mm. work so then if i follow my um, intention sometimes it looks very unorthodox like it doesn't look like a designer or it doesn't look like uh, you know like it doesn't look like a certain profession <laughs> but it, in me it makes complete sense so one big thing that I've done recently which I didn't have time to show you in so can I show you a slide yeah go go please please yeah so this is a new experiment and uh, I don't I don't know it could be a disaster, but I'm gonna show you. So I've been thinking about the nature of, um, like, so speculative design is a lot of talk about designing for debate, designing for discussions. Mm -hmm. And I think the nature of debate 10 years ago in 2010 is very, very different from the debate happening online in 2021. And I think you see in 2021, you, there are problems of like QAnon or conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And that I think the discussions, I, I don't know how to say this in a correct way, but I felt like 10 years ago, the discussions are a lot more um, in depth or a lot more progressive. Whereas now the, the discussions are like, there's so much discussions or debate online, but you see, like half of it is not even true. How, and more, maybe more than half of it is not even true. And it's a lot of bickering and a lot of hate speech. So I thought, okay, if I want to make work, 
and stimulate and create discussions. I feels like there's a potential that if I put my work, it's going to be overwhelmed with this other discussions happening in social media. So my next challenge is I am I just launched a new company. Uh, so I, I'm creating a new service. So it's like service for discussion, service for debate. So I managed to get $1.6 million invested in my new company recently. And I am a CEO. So that's my, so most of my work, I'm a CEO of a new company. So I have about, I have four full-time and um, three interns or working for me right now, trying to expand. So my new company is, um, so how shall I explain my new company? So I was, I was really annoyed at how the knowledge of menstruation, how to solve menstruation pain is not really spread in society. And also knowledge about fertility or egg freezing or uh, like these, I, I think for a lot of women, even though times have changed and we could, you know, there's so many professions you could be pursuing, the sort of biological clock, the fertility time limit hasn't really changed much from the ancient times, mm -hmm. which I'm really, you know, frustrated about. And I think egg freezing or fertility treatments, also like, you know, menstruation issues, all these fertility technology that solves these fertility issues I think they're very important and I want more people to know about it and I want more companies to support employees trying to have these treatments so I created a company uh, that provides these services like egg freezing fertility treatments to Japanese big companies so uh, we're launching properly in May this year so we're starting the trial in March and we already have really big names like Deloitte, the consulting company, uh, SoftBank, uh, Sony is interested, Paula, right? So this is my next challenge is I am a CEO. Uh, so this is a speculative design startup, but maybe different, like it's not so much speculating future, but it's kind of a company that asks questions, yeah. <laughs> it sounds great. I can, the thing that's, I mean, I have so many questions that, that might be kind of for a, set, a separate chat, but that kind of, um, one thing that really struck me with that, with the talking about it being, it seems futury, but actually it's here now is, um, I remember chatting to a, a friend very recently when we were talking about female fertility and particularly queer women um, and attempting to get pregnant. It's like, well, you have this, this kind of this futuristic narrative around, again, embryos and egg freezing and it's kind of the Shulamith Firestone ideas around it. Or you could go and, you know, hang out with a bunch of, you know, people who are trying to get pregnant in various different ways. And it's the same, it's the same technology, it's the same narrative. Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. it's happening now. It's, it's not happening in some kind of like chrome future. And so that, I think that kind of the idea of, it, it's there's kind of collapsing. Yeah, I agree. That seem very far away into something but, kind of, yeah, like. I so agree. The future is collapsing in on, in on us. It's not, not so much 10 years later. It's more, mm. we, we have parallel futures, I think. It's about, like te technology is there. It's about switching our minds or perspectives. And that's exactly the idea of ch future change. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, okay, I, you know, I, <laughs> sorry, carry on. I, I, no, I completely agree. I'm excited because I felt like in Japan, I haven't been able to discuss this like I think in Japan, people, I think I'm a crazy person. I, I'm not really capable of talking through my ideas enough. <laughs> like, not not many people <laughs> understand what I'm trying to do. So, I'm I'm very excited. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So I was gonna I was gonna just wrap the, that bit up with like the, I said at the yeah. beginning I, I had some quite ser you know, serious and heavy things I'd prepared and then we put those aside. But I did actually mm -hmm. dig out two quotes that I'd found when I was thinking about where we think about speculation what it does and, and also kind of to tap back to your previous point of the, 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 the discourse the world has changed in the past 10 years yeah. you know how we present things online and whether they're taken straight faced or whether they're taken as some version of truth and there were two quotes that came out I think from publications in the past month actually so from Timothy Snyder 
who's a professor, I think historian at Yale, and he's writing, he was writing about the American elections and about post-truth. And he said, the, the quote that came out from an article that came out in the New York Times, I think this last week, um, he said, is, when we give up on truth, we concede power to those with the wealth and the charisma to create spectacle in its place. So we've got, I think, this kind of idea of like the resources needed uh, for these kind of these big top, you know, top heavy narratives of fictions. But conversely with that, a quote from an art, uh, an art critic, Zarina Mohammed, uh, who's British, talking of another young feminist writer, Lola Olofemi. Uh, Zarina says of Lola's work, it has the potential to be a vehicle and, and accomplice to activism, describing the system as it is and how political liberation could shape it. So I think what you're talking about with kind of taking these tools for debate and having them as kind of shaping forces on the side of something much larger, but still kind of steering something by both articulating what is now, but also what could be feels very, very powerful in terms of like what work, what work gets done, I guess. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, it, it's, it's powerful, but I do understand the um, fear of someone with a lot of resources money mm. creating a spectacle that people want to believe in and but I think yeah so for me that's like I'm doing like a counter action like I, I'm working with spectacle yeah. but trying to counter yeah right and I think you know you have, we have these forces of there are there will you know there have always been narratives deployed say around science and technology to you know the idea of vaporware the idea of trying to get investment in so well like which I guess comes back to the idea of spectacle design that you can use those tools back on themselves to push mm. back, um, but also recognizing where the flow of power is and what mm. your intentions are, which sounds like that's yeah. just been a thread through your work. All the way yeah, through. so I think um, I've been always, so I was looking at spectacle. So for me, like pop music video mm. and like all this, you know, Vogue Japan, the spectacle, I sort of use spectacle as a tool now being a company CEO, I feel like I'm trying to tame capitalism. So I used to hate capitalism <laughs> as a student. Yeah. <laughs> so, so all my classmates went to work in like Goldman Sachs and like JP Morgan, like math, mm. imperial maths. And, and I hated, I hated that. So that's why I moved into RCA. But now I'm feeling like I need to understand and tame capitalism. So I so right now I'm learning about how to get investments and learning about stock options, <laughs> learning about, and it's interesting. But I'm determined to understand capitalism now. <laughs> yes, but it, I, it kind of it feels if it, yeah. it feels similar in a way to kind of you know there was just that great bit earlier in your talk you talk about kind of make, making the initial red silk with the biochemists um, and you're just like and they made it and like eight weeks later they were producing stuff and so that involved a level of like understanding of genetic manipulation and material of an, an understanding of a system a biological system and what you're talking about here is an understanding of an economic and financial system in order to figure out what steerage points like and where you might press at it to like to get it to do slightly different things so it's, yeah, it still feels like kind of like engaging with different forms of literacy yeah, yeah. to produce different forms of action. Yeah, yeah I feel, it feels like that, like hacking capitalism, because capitalism, like in the end, if you have capital, you could have people work for you, you can make big movements. And in the end, capitalism has been too dominated by a lot of men, a lot of white people. And if you sort of stare away from capitalism, in it, like... I, I hated it, but I thought, I think I came to a point, I thought I have to understand it <laughs> if I want to do like a bigger project. So yeah, mm. but I'm still struggling. Like I'm not an expert yet. I mean, yeah. there's time. You said like this is the next five to 10 years and then kind of yeah. what the next unexpected thing is. Let's see, it's incredible. <laughs> like if I, it could be devastating if I, if I, you know, become broke and like everything's done, like, you know, if you give me like a teaching job, like, like a small class, I could teach on, <laughs> online from Tokyo. Like, but let's see I can't. if I, you know, I'm gonna see how my company grows. I hope I don't like go in a mess, but. <laughs> yes. I, have, I have faith, I have faith. And I kind of feel that, you know, we started off as like being a computer scientist and then a pop star and then a CEO, yes. like the next career yeah. jump after that is gonna be, who knows? Like it, it might well be, you know, your girl on the moon.
Um, uh, I'm aware that we I'm aware we've got questions coming in, so um, I'm not gonna. So let's kind of roll in to see what we've got. Okay, I'm I'm just gonna take these in order, and I'm going through the Q and A channel, and then we'll jump. I think we've got some in the chat as well. Um, so from Rachel, uh, Rachel asked the first question and she asks, oh, she says, thank you for giving the lecture today. Um, she's been interested in your work since she saw the video of the Moonwalk Machine. What advice would you have to young aspiring designers who are going towards speculative design in multiple design fields? What advice do I have to, mm, like th this is like, I, th I think this is an advice that not is not just speculative design, but I, especially if you're a young designer, sometimes if you, I think it's good to go crazy about what you like to create or what you want to achieve. And if you aim high, and if you believe in what you're producing, then, um, like oftentimes, also, I, I was since I was a student, I was already working in teams. I was using social media to find people to help me out. So for me, like to aim high, to have a vision really helped me get the team I needed to create my works. So I think many students think that they need to do everything completely on their own. But I, I think it's not the case Like you could be a director. And find people to collaborate, help you and make a work. So yeah, like be open to collaboration. And if you're collaborating, aim high and believe in your project. So that keeps the team going. That, that's the advice is not just for speculative designers, but for students in general. Yeah. God, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, just do okay. So from Jonathan, we have the question who says, uh, "I love the production of your videos, and you seem to take many roles, like which like acting, music production, prop creation. Uh, what would you say is your is the hardest role to take on, and what's your favorite role to take okay. on?" Hardest role is, I think, the hardest role would be, I am, I just hate um doing like the details <laughs> the receipts like um, how does like, I, I love imagining thinking directing i also love like people team building but um i am so bad at keeping track of my receipts <laughs> that i'm so bad at writing so um i am anything like anything detail i'm really 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 bad so but then I make sure I find that now I have a admin assistant who could work on that. So I think I always make sure that if I find any role difficult, I try to not do it. <laughs> I try to keep away from it and find, find a way to have, you know, find a way to sort of organize a team so I don't have to do things that I'm not very good at. But I, I enjoy all roles, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I don't. Know I, I think I think that's a fair one. That, it's yeah. a fair one. I think that comes back to teamwork. The teamwork as well. That you know you can have all these different things, but when you're when you're doing stuff as a group, you don't have to do a bunch of stuff, and that's kind yeah. of the good the good and also productive part of it as well. Um, okay, from where we have the question: um, How how do you think about the interactions between artificial intelligence and humanity? And will you do a project on this topic? Thank you. Ah. Uh. Yes, yes. I, actually, that's the next big interest I have uh, um, for me is, well, I'm, I'm sure Georgina, I'm sure you're also aware is that AI has a lot of issues in terms of bias and inequality. Like, mm -hmm. because of the nature of the AI, it learns from the data that we already have, mm -hmm. which means it learns all the inequalities, bio biases that we have in the data, like uh, just for some people listening uh, that who don't know some of the um, issues is that, for example, Amazon, they were using, they were trying to develop an AI to help them hire employees, but they learned that Amazon, because in the past they didn't hire that many female employees, the artificial intelligence from the data learned that, okay, 
maybe Amazon doesn't need to recruit so many women. So AI, they were, if you gave a CV that had anything to do with women or female, AI was deducting or kind of rejecting more women than men, a little bit like the university that I, that I was um, criticizing. So like AI being bi biased against women, also there's AI issues of AI being biased against black people in America, like uh, Compass, that, that's an AI that's used in um, American courts that, that they're giving very harsh um, results to people of color. So AI, uh, we really need to look at this issue of AI and bias. And right now I'm working in this like fertility field, but I feel like if I have my next step, I'd like to solve that issue. And I like to think of a way, maybe is that a new tool or a service? Or maybe I go back to making a film? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But jo Georgina, I'm sure you know a lot about this issue too. Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, doing a, we're doing a project at the moment at the oh. design school I work at, uh, looking at, um, working with the BBC, looking at stock images and machine learning yeah. and particularly how they're represented visually and the limits of visual representation when you're thinking about this. And I think coming back to the most pop videos of like how images work as cultural vectors. So the kind of the, the, this is the kind of the things that get embedded into an image as it travels. If you click through something on the BBC website or the New York Times website, um, the image does as much work as the text does. And so we're kind of really interested in kind of pushing back at, again, again, pushing back at that system with our own tools and thinking about what else you could do. So it's, it's a lovely project. Oh, can you please invite me to your online? If you do it online, I can yeah. see Game From Talk. Oh my God, I, no, absolutely. I, that would be great. Because I, I think one thing, um, I'm a bit of a lone wolf in Japan. Not many people are looking in these issues of like technology and bias, so, you know, social issues. I would love any classes, events, please send me links like Georgina or Maria or anyone listening to yeah. this. Um, we, we, yeah. we will we will and I'll, I'll kind of i'll send it we've got the first of the videos up in the chat i'll send them through to all of you i would be well. so happy um, thank you <laughs> um more from the chat they're coming in now which is lovely all right so we have um from Annie, Annie asks, uh, regarding what you just mentioned about people debating and conflict, getting into conflict over information in the media that's true or not true, uh, what's your outlook? What's your perspective on that? Um, is it something we can just accept as the current phenomena or is it an issue we can hope to bring attention to? Um, so, many, so many emotions being manipulated and hate is being created. So yeah, this is, this is timely. And I, I think, yeah, coming back to speculative design, it's, the, 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 things have changed in the past decade, and this question, Annie, thank you, is particularly relevant. Thank you. Both of this talk so relevant, so relevant, and so um, it is so difficult too because I think you know, like ten years ago, or even you know, like 10, 15, 20 years ago, I think there was a big, big fun, foundational trust in freedom of speech freedom to say whatever you want but now like the social media you you have to start thinking about freedom of speech and fact and fiction and conspiracy theory and the balance between that because like the twitter banned trump uh, right after the insurrection the capital riot and youtube banned trump and all this social media banned him and in the end that really reduced the I think it reduced by 70 percent the amount of discussions about conspiracy theories online but it is quite alarming to think that very few companies now have so much power about over who communicates what ideas but I think the state that we were seeing in the United States, and I guess it's not just the US, it's happening in Britain as well with like mm. Brexit. It, it was, uh, I think people, people's brains are not designed for social media. Like in the end, like 
fake news, uh, sensational news works much better to um, incite a brain. And I think the idea of freedom of speech, we really need to rethink and redesign. <laughs> and I, as, this is almost like a taboo to bring up that we need to rethink about like soft sen censorship, like soft design of what's said and not. And like China does it perfectly. Like China censors anything to do with Tiananmen Square and like anything. And to see how like what's happening in, but then China like also has this issue about control power and then United States going crazy with the conspiracy theory. And like, I, I, I think we need to really design like how we communicate and what's communicated. And this is like a new system or philosophy we really need to think about. And I, I interviewed a Stanford professor. I, I was, so I created a documentary program for NHK in Japan. It's like BBC in Japan. And it, it was a whole documentary program looking at Cambridge Analytica scandal. So I, I went to interview, um, Sorry, what's the guy guy's name who? Um, sorry, um, the the guy with the pink hair and the glasses, who was working oh, at Cambridge um, Analytica, <laughs> interviewed Chris, him. Chris, Chris Wiley, yeah. I think. Yeah, Chris Wiley. Yes, yeah, okay. his, I yeah. yeah I interviewed Chris Wiley. I interviewed the prof Stanford professor who gave research to Cambridge Analytica, the rush, um, and then uh, and there was a professor who said that. We used to have a lot of problems with um, spam email. So we used to get so many spam emails, but we found a way of filtering spam. Maybe like it's the same for fake news or news, like information. Maybe like we're living in like spam times and in a few years, we're gonna find a way to resolve it or filter it. But it's so such a big issue. No, no one has an answer yet. Well, how, how do you feel about this, Georgina? This is so difficult. Oh man, I think yeah, yeah I think this is more it's more more than we have time for. But um, yeah, I think there are massive differences between kind of state controlled speech, privately controlled speech. But I do think there's also something very important about the way that information travels at the moment. The idea of verification. Um, one of the things I one of the smaller facts I found most interesting that I've kind of seen again coming up in the past few weeks around the Trump ban was an article I can't remember right now but he'd said that one of the reasons why you get um distrust in large media and why that kind of gets into spillovers around say conspiracy theories um is a destruction of small local news and if you have small local news you can see like the stuff outside your window and you can see the stuff down your street and you know that you can have some point of verification. It's like, oh, that happens. Okay, well, that I, I can like triangulate and make sense of that. But when that gets taken away and the news suddenly becomes much more top down and hierarchical, it becomes much harder to either feel you have any engagement with it or to kind of get any sense of fact checking and truth making. Mm -hmm. And, and in, that, in that kind of gap, is exactly the space where conspiracy theories and kind of distrust arises. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done. I think the, soci obviously like the sociologists are on it. I think they're fine, but kind of like where that gets designed into large systems, which again comes back to kind of like this literacy about capitalism and power. I think that's the kind of the yeah. bigger, the bigger, the bigger issue as well. Um, there's a, I'm going to um, give a quick pitch to my friend's book for this one. Uh, my friend uh, Joanne McNeil wrote a book called Lurking that came out last year, which is a really excellent kind of history of the idea of the user in our big online systems um, and like how the idea of use and users got constructed. And it's, it's fascinating, it's very readable and I think it speaks oh, yeah. to this. So I can, I can stick that in the chat. Thank you, yeah. Hey. Um, I'm super- So difficult. My, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm super mindful of time, so I'm going to see. I'm just checking if we've got any more questions. Uh, we're going to finish, I think, actually. Oh, no, okay, Christina. I'm going to finish with you, Christina. I see we've got a few more, but I think I had a vague instructions to wrap up around now. So, Christina asks um, 
this is a great question, Christina. Um, how has the pandemic affected your work? For example, robots seem to be more in demand because they provide a contactless form of interaction. Does this influence your ideas when thinking about speculative design in the future? Mm. I think like one way it has affected now, like one thing is now we're having more of these online talks and events, which mm. I really am grateful of. Like even in my classes, I, I can invite someone, the designers based in London, talk, talk to my class in Tokyo. So that's one positive change. Another change was that I often talked about, you know, designing to question all different alternative future scenarios or stimulate discussions. And I think now that pandemic has happened, it feels like the unthinkable happened for so many people. So it, the idea of speculative design is easily understood to so many more people now because so many un things that are supposed to be unthinkable have happened a lot recently and pandemic is different, definitely one of them. So maybe not so much my work's changed, but I think that how people think about my work or see my work has changed. Yeah, my work, like I, I set up, I created my company just before the pandemic. So it hasn't really <laughs> changed what I'm working on, but yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah. yeah, great question, Christina, thank you. Um, and thank you as well. Um, I'm gonna, that's just a really nice note to finish on, on kind of, we've been living through the, we're living through the unthinkable, but that kind of expands our horizons in a way and our capacity yeah. to do this kind of work. Um, so with that, Maria, I'm going to hand back to you for any final Thank things. you. Thank, Thank you, you both so much. Um, this has really been a pleasure, and I thoroughly enjoyed both the talk and the conversation, how it kind of evolved and took multiple paths. Uh, something that I really appreciated um, that was mentioned in the conversation, this notion of multiple futures, which I think, uh, Georgina, we, we also had this a similar type of conversation in an event a few months ago where you know, this notion of multiple futures and our responsibility as people across fields and kind of between disciplines trying to imagine as many of them as possible and then having imagined kind of pick the ones that are preferable and try to move towards them rather than away from them. Um, I think that is just an excellent uh, kind of highlight that I wanted to bring back to wrap the conversation. Um, I would love to thank you again for being here. It is a huge pleasure and honor to have you, even though virtually the one huge regret mm. that I have about the pandemic is that we don't get to kind of continue hanging out and I don't get to show you around Toronto now. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap the event and wrap the conversation. Um, I have just lost my script for the wrapping of the event, of course, because, you know, too many screens. There we go. Um, so one thing that I would like to mention before we say goodbye to our speakers and all of our attendees is to remind you that uh, the Daniels calendar of events uh, continues. And I would like to invite you to both check out the website and the news and events page keep track of what we're organizing. Some of the events that are coming up next week uh, include a conversation between Julia Smutchilo, I'm apologizing if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, and Jackie Hamilton, uh, which is part of our student alumni series um, titled What's Next? And that is happening on Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And for the rest of the program, please check the website, uh, register and join us and to echo Sputnikos uh, comment, it is really a pleasure to be able to attend so many events without necessarily being in the right time zone um, and in the right geographic location to be attending those events. And with this, I hope we see you all online and eventually offline soon. Uh, have a lovely morning, afternoon and night, depending on where you are. And thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you so much. I had so much fun. Thank you so much, so Georgina lovely. Maria. Thank, thank you. you. It was really fun. And yes, keep thank you, touch. everyone. Yes. Yeah, keep in touch. <laughs> thank you. And good night and sleep well, please. Yes. It must be very late. <laughs> yes. It's about 1.30. So yeah. Oh my. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. Thank you.